what would be the ideal situation for the living conditions and situations for the family? Um, you know, do you need schools? Do you need hospitals? Do you need infrastructure? Do you like riding your motorcycle around on the weekends for, you know, long trips? What are, what are all those things? Then we figure out what are the jurisdictions that will fit those criteria and which ones can we do tax efficiently? What are the, the one, two, and three, you know, the top three, basically like strategies that you guys find yourself deploying more and more as, as we kind of travel closer to this place? Is there a particular country that fits best for a lot of people? Is there a particular, um, is there, is there pros and cons to, to giving up the, the citizenship? What, what are those? Walk me through some of the actual like solutions. Sure, I'll I'll start on this. So, um, if you go to either of our websites, you'll see a four-part, very detailed um, series of articles that Mel and I I did. So, I'm going to kind of fly at thirty thousand feet. So, what's the right jurisdiction? Well, that depends on completely on the family situation, what you could sell at, as we were saying before, sell at the breakfast table. So, I, for example, have nine-year-old twins. So, I'm going to be somewhere where I can, where they're going to be going to school for nine months of the year. That's a completely different situation than, you know, uh, empty nesters who, who, who like like to travel. Some people like to live in big cities. Some people like to live in in remote areas. Some people like to speak live in a. Uh, a, a jurisdiction where everybody speaks the, you know, their own language, other people are more adventurous. So we look at, so one of the first things that we do is look at kind of what are the, let's assume we can deal with all immigration and tax issues. What would be the ideal situation for the living conditions and situations for the family? Um, you know, do you need schools? Do you need hospitals? Do you need infrastructure? Do you like riding your motorcycle around on the weekends for, you know, long trips. What are, what are all those things? Then we figure out what are the jurisdictions that will fit those criteria and which ones can we do tax efficiently? And one of the interesting things, a lot of people, when they think of tax exiles, think of small islands that people live on, you know, Necker Island or, you know, or Cayman or something. Very few of my clients end up being in those kind of jurisdictions. They're actually in jurisdictions which are thought of as high tax jurisdictions, but which have special regimes or with tax planning can be low tax jurisdictions. That includes places like Canada, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, um, Italy. Uh, Italy is a very popular one. Switzerland, people have, may have know about. Greece, Malta, Cyprus, Singapore. I mean, there's a there's a bunch of jurisdictions that are, are thought of, as, you know, the general public thinks that they are uh, high tax countries, but with proper advice can actually result in a, in a very low or regulated um, tax burden on the clients. So, for example, in Switzerland, David and I worked on this situation a couple of years ago. We had a Silicon Valley individual who had uh, acquired a Maltese passport in 2015 and had decided by 2020 that he wanted out of the U.S. And that what he wanted to do is he wanted to really just retire and not pay income tax. He had lived in California in Silicon Valley and so he wanted out of the U.S. and out of the high tax system. And he ended up in Switzerland on a Maltese passport, in part because in Switzerland, the arrangement was that so long as he was not working and was, quote, retired at 44 and was not taking the job of any Swiss individuals, any Swiss residents, he could come and live there and there would be no income tax. He pays on a flat dollar basis that's negotiated based on where he lives in Switzerland with, with the rural cantons offering the best and lowest fixed dollar amounts. That worked for him. Doesn't work and, for and, everyone. And one other thing to point out is he had pre-IPO shares and he knew both of the, he was a founder in two kind of major companies. And, they, and both of those companies were about to go private or go, go public, sorry. And so he knew that there was going to be a pop. So one of the big motivators for him to get out at that particular time was that he could enjoy that pop in valuation free of U.S. taxation. And of course, 
because he had pre-IPO shares, we were able to do valuations, which reduced, you know, because those were restricted shares and they had lockups and a number of other things that reduced the value of that. Um, you know, his cost basis was a dollar, you know, and, and so he was able to get the, those significantly down, which, which, you know, with, with the planning that, that Mel was putting in place in that fire escape plan, he was able to kind of jump out of the U.S. pot at a much lower cost than he would have had the day after the IPOs. Yeah, the, the strategy, frankly, that we uh, uh, employed there were valuation discounts, one of the things that's on the chopping block, according to the Biden Green Book. And we took roughly 8 uh, percent discounts based on blockage, on the theory that the positions that he held was so large they could not all be sold in one day. And we submitted valuation reports with these two large positions to substantiate taking these significant discounts in valuing the two positions on his Form 8854 expatriation statement.